Now this is the whole pack of info that was given to you, that was supposed to be in your notes, which, I will, which we will be sending you electronically. All right? Um, the first, and we're going to run through it like this, okay? So those guys on webinar two, it's just the first one. I'm just going to give, briefly give you, tell you what's in here. I'm not going to go through the whole questionnaire because it will spend five hours just discussing it. But basically, this, this is the latest questionnaire that we have in circulation through Large Business Center, okay? It's dated the 1st of October 2012, and that's basically the principle of what they do when in terms of Section 47 of the Tax Administration Act, they come out and ask you, we want to complete this questionnaire with you, all right? As you can see, it runs through pages and pages of yes, no's, maybes, and all the rest of it for 135 questions at the end of the day. I'm not going to go into those details, but it's something for you to look at. Bearing in mind, if you want to do a semi-review of your compliance within the aspect, looking at these questions are going to give you an indication as to where there may or may not be an error. Okay, please, I don't even do these payroll reviews anymore. Okay, because where do you start and where do you stop? Because these 135 questions lead to another 700 questions, okay? So depending on your yes or no. So in other words, you could spend months and months and months going through. The problem being is at the end of the day, you won't have, SARS has got the luxury, they choose what they want to look at. You don't have that luxury, you need to look at everything. But if you're having a payroll review done, you have to have it done via your attorney. Why? Because the attorney is going to share client attorney privilege. Whereas you, as a practitioner, do not have that. So when SARS comes along, because one of the questions in here is, when last was your payroll reviewed for compliance? I oh, say, so no, it was done last year. By who? Oh, my auditor. Mr. Auditor can have that report. And bearing in mind, every time you find something wrong in your payroll, it normally means that you're going to have to pay the people more to put them in the same tax position, correct? And normally that doesn't happen. And the most damning thing that you can find is a report from a tax practitioner or an auditor saying your payroll has got the following problems. Because normally a year goes by, two years go by, and nothing happens because <coughs> we're still trying to fix up our admin and it's going to cost us more at the end of the day. SARS picks up that doc and says, then all of a sudden you are now got a criminal matter on your hands. Because you with intent, after being informed by your auditor or tax practitioner that you're incorrectly doing something in your payroll, you continue to do the same. So how much understatement penalty are you going to get? 200%. Okay, so if you do do payroll reviews internally, not a problem. Externally, always provide that via your attorney. Okay, that's the only thing I'm saying on this. But go through it. If you find a problem, please address it. Be careful of emails, people. You send an email to the boss saying this is wrong. Send it to HR and they put it in your personnel file. Okay? And SARS picks it up when they come visit. Please, if you've got a contentious issue like this, make sure it's not on the records until you have resolved as to how you're going to fix it. Because these things can lie in companies for years and years and years. SARS picks it up and says, you knew about it. Thank you very much. 200% understatement penalty. And can you argue? You're just going to pay. Okay. So that's the payroll questionnaire. You will get it in electronic format. Have a look at those questions they pose. It's very good to have a basic understanding as to where their thought process is going. And then something that obviously with new amendments and everything else in place, which I wanted to cover, is our infamous little Provident Fund post-retirement annuity. Okay. Some of you deal with Provident Funds. Some of you don't. Those of you that don't may have clients that have got a provident fund. And what is every single broker in the country currently telling every poor person that is on a provident fund? You better take your money out now because it's going to be restricted next year. You can't move it. It's going to be in a, you've got to put it in a preservation fund and you can't touch it. You know that is? Have you heard that? That's a load of crap. Okay. Why do I say that? Because we've got two things that have come through in the retirement re reform. One was a thing called T-Day. Okay? T-Day was when we moved to the new contributions and the new payouts, okay? which I'm going to address today. The secondary thing was a thing called P-Day, which was when the government was going to enforce that no person 
before the age of retirement could actually withdraw any of their funds from a pension or provident fund, they had to be put into a preservation fund until they reached the age of 55, okay, which is deemed normal retirement. That P-Day has not been set and it hasn't been brought into effect. Okay? So nobody needs to panic and pull their money out and go and do whatever they want to at this stage. Uh, I do a lot of work with the motor industry fund administrators. They have, on request per week, more than 400 requests from people who are actually resigning their jobs to get their payments of their pension, uh, their provident fund before the 1st of March next year. And who's advising them? The brokers. Now, am I blaming or saying bad things about every broker? Those that are doing it, yes, because all they're making is their 20% commission and the person doesn't have to do it. All right, so what's going to happen? And I'm going to give you a little bit of background on this aspect. All these notes are here for you to have a look at when you're bored or if you've got a client that's specific. But basically, the reason why we have this change in the whole process in terms of retirement saving is twofold. One, what is happening? Today is my last day at the company. I'm now going on retirement. Now I'm on a provident fund, which allows me to pull all my money out. So today is my last day. I have my little farewell party. We all enjoy ourselves. And I put in my application to have my full lump sum withdrawal from my provident fund. By Friday, I've got no money left. Exactly. But then, on Monday morning next week, I'm now standing at the social grants office. Okay, I'm not going to go into the politics here. <laughs> I hear what you're saying, which is true. Okay? Now, the only problem being is, is because mostly this has affected the government pension funds, provident funds, which are now running into depletion. Then there's another thing that also comes into effect. So now it's Friday. We decide we're having a briar. Hubby and wife sitting around saying, you know, I want to go to Italy in December. But we don't have money. We can't go to the bank because of this. That. Why don't we get divorced? We get divorced, and then you give me 100% of your provident fund. Cool. So Monday we go to the courts, because what's a piece of paper anyway? All right? I mean, some of those with a paper are still messing around anyway, so what's a piece of paper? Okay? So we go on Monday to the courts and say, okay, cheers, we divorced. Here comes the court order, 100% of the provident fund to be paid to the spouse. Get the money, we go to Italy, and thanks very much, it's done. Okay? Those applications at the motor industry fund administrators are 50 a week. Okay. Now, I'm giving an idea how much this is affecting the bigger picture of the stability. Now, getting back to your other point, it's my right. Let's be honest. My father-in-law is 82 years old. In 1960, when they told him he could get a million bucks when he went in retirement, he thought it was like, wow. What is a million bucks today? Zero. How many of us can retire here? None of us. That's what the wife always says. When are we going to retire? I said, I'm going to retire. I can't afford to. I mean, that's the bottom line. Now, the only way and the only reason for that is, is what is the rand worth today, what it was 20 years ago? We all know that example. Okay? So there's more factors to this bigger picture. What government's trying to do is try and curb so that people with, in that aspect have got, still got some idea as to its savings for retirement to try and assist. It's a cultural change that all of us, because all of us have that. If we earned, if a million bucks in 1960 was a million bucks today, we wouldn't have this problem, would we? Look, we, we, we know the bigger picture. I mean, there's a lot more to it than that. This is what we're getting now from Treasury telling us this is the reason why they're changing, okay? Huh? Well, we know. We know. But as I said, we, I can't go there. <laughs> All right. But basically what happens now, we, uh, and, the, and if we look at the provident fund aspect, bearing in mind most of that is, and this is where disparity is from a tax perspective. In the first instance, a provident fund contribution is always an employer contribution, Correct. It's so always the company making the contribution, and that normally is a 20%. Where does a 20% come from? That's the approved remuneration aspect in place. Why is an employer contribution? Because if you make the contribution to a provident fund in your personal capacity, you pay tax on it. Okay. In a, provident, in a pension fund, we have a 7.5% employer contribution and a 7.5% employee contribution, totaling 15%. On a retirement annuity, we have a 15% maximum individual contribution at the end of the day. So from that perspective alone, we have disparity between how much are the contributions going through. Okay? The other aspect which is more important, and that's what SARS is trying to get at in terms of the provident fund alignment, is saying 
If you've got a provenant fund, you can take all your money. If you have a pension fund, you are obliged to do annuitization, which basically means you're getting one-third paid to you, and the balance is a two-third principle. But if you've, got a if you've got a pension fund, it's exactly the same. So pension fund retirement annuities work exactly the same. So given the reasons that I've stated, as I was saying, people are spending their money before that, they are moving back to having all funds, including a provident retirement and a pension fund, to be treated exactly the same. So from the 1st of March 2015, you will have a change where from a contribution perspective, they will be the same, and we'll talk about that now, but effectively from a withdrawal perspective, you will be only entitled to take out one-third and two-thirds, except they have made provision for prehistoric rights. So what your fund needs to do, on the Provident Fund only, on the 1st of March 2015, they need to take a balance of what your fund is worth. Okay? That is called account number one. That stays in place and it will continue to grow. You won't contribute to it anymore. It will continue to grow. Your contributions after the 1st of March 2015 will be in account number two. Okay? Which will have contributions and the growth thereon. So let's give you the example to try and clarify that a little bit more for you. So let's say I had 200,000 Rand on the 1st of March in my Provident Fund. I get to retirement age, my account number one has reached 300,000. Why? Because I've had 100,000 Rand's growth. My account number two is sitting at 300,000 Rand. My contributions plus the growth that's in there. So I've got a total of 600,000 Rand available in terms of my payments that can be made. What's the rules? On the first 300,000 Rand lying in account number one, I can take everything. There's no limitations, there's no annuitization. So I'll get 300,000 Rand paid out to me. Obviously, if there's any tax implication, it'll be done. On account number two, out of the 300,000 Rand that's lying in account number two, I'm only entitled to take out 100,000 Rand as a lump sum, and the other 200,000 will be paid to me as a monthly pension. Right, so there's some protection for those parties that have contributed up to a provident fund up to the 1st of, October, 1st of March 2015. However, if you are 55 years old on the 1st of March 2015, you will then not be required to annuitize your provident fund contributions until retirement. So in other words, if you are 55 on the 1st of March 2015 and you continue contributing until you reach the normal retirement age in the company, let's say 65, when you retire in 10 years' time, your full amount can be paid to you as a lump sum. Okay. So that's the changes that are in place. Nowhere, and that's all in the Act already and it's law, okay? Nowhere does it say you're not going to be able to take your money out. Okay? If you're going to do a withdrawal next year, you can still do a withdrawal. So there's no forced aspect to saying you've got to take your money at the end of the day. That's the thing called P-Day, the preservation day where government wants to enforce that you may not take money before you retire. That has, not, that has been on the cards, but there's no date in place. Okay, so that's the effective. Well, we understand how it's going to work from next year, right? So most people will be in a very similar position. Those that are closer to retirement will still be able to take their full money and do what they want with is this PYE? The answer is yes. Of course, it's to do with your contributions at the end of the day. Any questions on that? Right, so we move on to the next page in that little bookie and we talk about the contributions. How is it going to work from next year? So now we're all aligned in that same aspect. However, uh, just get there quick. Sorry, there's no page numbers on here, but if you flip through da, 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 to the next one, you'll get to the incentive, revised contributions. All right, so I've explained now the 20%, the 7.5%, the 75 and the 15%. So with effect from next year, what's going to happen to employer contributions? All employer contributions are going to be taxed as a fringe benefit. Okay? So the 20% company contribution to the Provident Fund, French benefit. The 7.5% to the pension fund, French benefit. However, at the same stage, once that contribution has been done and is shown as effectively as a company contribution, you as an individual will then be entitled, it's going to be deemed to be your contribution. You as an individual will be able to contribute based on your remuneration or taxable income, that's what it says, 
27.5% of that value can be contributed to a pension fund, provident fund, or retirement annuity. Are we following? Which means 99% of us sitting around here that's on a pension, provident, or retirement annuity will be in exactly the same tax position as we were before. In fact, you could actually start contributing more at the end of the day because before you would have done 15% on your RA. Now you can do 27.5%. Your provident fund would have been 20%. Now you can do 275 and so with the pension fund at the end of the day. There's only one restriction. No person may contribute as a tax deductible amount anything that exceeds 350,000 Rand for the year. Now that's the problem. Because if I'm earning 2 million bucks a year and my company contribution to a provident fund per rule, say it's 20%. That's 400,000 Rand I have to contribute based on the rules of the fund. But I'm only going to get a tax deduction immediately of 350,000. So that means the other 50,000 is going to be taxed, meaning I'm paying tax and I'm doing the contribution. And effectively what's going to happen is I'm going to have to wait till I get to retirement to have that amount then deducted from any lump sum, considering that a lump sum is only going to be a third and not the full amount. Okay? Now that's a problem for a lot of people. So what a recommendation in that aspect is to change the rules of your fund and you need to do it now by stipulating that your contributions are based on 20% of your remuneration component or your cash salary basic as it normally says. However, these contributions will be limited to 350,000 unless you want to make additional. So in other words, that way you can curb that loss of the 50k that you're making and paying tax on it and only getting it one third paid out on it. So that's how the contributions are going to work going forward from next year. At the end of the day, from a payroll perspective, we are going to have a problem. Why? Because the Act says it's 27.5% of remuneration or taxable income. So what's going to happen is if you take a normal person's pay slip, it says salary, but then we get a little thing called traveling allowance. Now, bearing in mind, only 80% of that traveling allowance, or maybe 20, depending on the circumstances, is added to remuneration. So if I take that amount, 80% plus my cash salary, and I do 27.5%, it is going to be different to when I get to taxable income. Why? Because I've now claimed the balance of my 80% as a traveling allowance, so my taxable income is going to, is going to reduce. So when we're doing the calculations, you might have people that come along and say, especially if you want to up your contribution levels, you must be careful you don't fall foul of that calculation. Monthly you're getting the tax benefit, but you're going to pay in it at year end because your taxable income is lower than what your remuneration is. So that's the only thing from a payroll perspective that you need to bear in mind and also from a planning perspective for, for your clients at the end of the day. Other than that, that's the changes. It's in the Act. You can look at Section 11K, Section 11L, and Paragraph 2.1 of the 7th Schedule. That will tell you exactly how the process is going to run.